All right. Uh, I think we got chapter 34, is that correct? I think we were about to start talking about uh, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, I think we talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, I think we stopped at 19, but I want us to back up a little bit to verse, uh, verse I started at verse 17. Exodus chapter 34, verse 17. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. The, the feast of unleavened bread shall thou keep. Seven days shall thou eat unleavened bread as, it, as I command thee in the time of the month of Abib, for in that month of Abib thou shalt, thou camest out from Egypt. I think we talked about this a little bit last week. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the month of Abib. Uh, this is basically the same time as, of, 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 usually it's the same time that we celebrate Ishtar, or Easter, if you want to call it that. But, uh, but <coughs> the, the time, the, um, it's always in the spring. Uh, it's always, uh, Zola Levitt, a guy I used to a lot, lo love to watch, he's a Messianic Jew was on TV, he's died, he, he's dead now, but he said that uh, the easiest way to know when the Passover is, he said even a per, even somebody that was out in the field and hadn't been on home, was out tending their sheep and, uh, and wasn't get, communicating with anybody else, they could, know, they could know when the Passover was. They said, he said that basically what you do is you look at the, the trees. The trees are budding, once the trees start budding, it's the first uh, full moon after that, uh, in the month, in that month, the month of Abib or Nisan. So you could determine then when, when Passover was. Uh, and <clears throat> it's a little different than the way that, that we, we celebrate it. Sometimes we, that we, it comes together, but sometimes not. Uh, but uh, in fact, the Jews this, this year just celebrated Passover, if I'm not mistaken, I think we talked, mentioned this last week also, that we, uh, they started, uh, they celebrated just a couple of weeks ago Passover. Uh, whereas we celebrated Easter a month or so earlier. So, uh, so sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's a month apart. But anyhow, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, is is a seven day feast. It's, of course, it's what, it, what it says here. Seven days shall thou eat unleavened bread. Does, they, does everybody know what unleavened bread is? Most of y'all have been. Most of y'all have been to the seder meals, huh? No yeast. No yeast. It's kind, it's, it looks kind of like crackers. They don't have any salt on them though. Uh, how did they, How did they make the bread rise? They didn't. They did. That's the reason. Why. It's, it's it's not right. It don't rise. But they didn't eat the leavened bread. So the leavened bread, yeah, they had leavened bread, but not on Passover. <laughs> what she's asking, what did they when they had the what did they put in it? You know, the, the ingredients. Oh, I guess yeast or you something. Have yeast to make probably it had rise. cultures that they kept but, it all the time, but or maybe I don't know. But you, yeah, they put. Yeah, I'm sure they done. They they did something in order to have bread, because normally uh, on the on the Sabbath, especially if they had meetings or gatherings together, they would eat leavened bread. Uh, uh, if they got together, they didn't eat unleavened bread all the time. They, was, they would they would eat leavened bread. In fact. Uh, I remember going to the Messianic congregation a few times, and they would have big loaves of bread that they, you could you were supposed to take a bite off of it as you come in the door. Uh, pinch you pinch you some off, and and, and uh, some of them would dip it in wine too, uh, and eat that when they come in. Yeah, I remember we go in there. We go in about each place. They always have a bunch of bread. Oh yeah. Like that but the leaven is only for pass they only for their major holidays the the unleavened bread and what does of course you know what leaven represents right 
even in scripture, it represents sin. As, uh, I know when, when, we, when they do the Passover or do the, the Seder meal, uh, the, 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 head of the, the head of the family would have a couple little crumbs <coughs> of leavened bread put on the table. Uh, and, this, and when they would start to start to, the, um, uh, the 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 meal, the first thing about the first thing, first thing you would do was, well, I believe he did that. Act. Anyhow, you would take a wooden spoon and a feather, and he would rake the crumbs of with off of the table into the spoon with that with a feather, and then he would wrap. And once he got it all on, in the spoon, he would wrap it with a wrap it up with a. Uh, uh, a towel, or take it outside, or a napkin or something, take it outside and he would put it in a fire and burn it. And that would be symbolizing that all the leaven was out of the home. Uh, there was no no leaven whatsoever in, in the home in, in any circumstance. And of course, this is kind of what you're saying. I don't know where they would put their uh, cultures or whatever. If they had that, they would have to take it out of the house. And, and not have it in the house, they would have to put it somewhere else, I assume. Um, but uh, but uh, anyhow, that's what they would do, and just do it on the first day. Uh, they would eat unleavened bread for a week uh, during that period of time. Uh, the feast would last for eight days, or actually seven, seven days, but then the eighth day was a day of celebration. But uh, in this eight, in these seven days, uh, also, you had the Passover would occur. Uh, actually, the Passover started started it all. They had the Passover meal the first time, the first day, or the first night uh, of the of the Passover, and then then later on, uh, sometime through the week, they would have the feast of uh, 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 first fruits. It's kind of complicated. I'm not going to try to go into it right now, but we we can sometime. But what day that that would happen? They believe that it now. They used to believe that it was on, always on Sunday, the first day of the week, uh, when the, the feast of first fruits would occur, because it because it matched with the resurrection of Jesus. The Jews changed it, changed the way they figured it out, so that it don't always happen on Sunday, because it matched too well for them. They didn't like that. But uh, from that day, then they would count fifty days, uh, and that then that would bring them up to Sukkot, or not Sukkot, uh, Shavuot, or uh, uh, Pentecost. That what we call it, Pentecost. So that took care of four feasts. But they, here, right now, they're talking about basically the feast of unleavened bread, when they would eat uh, unleavened bread for seven days. They would begin it with the Passover when they would have unleavened bread, and I think it, how many of how many of y'all have been to a seder meal? Most of you have. Some of you haven't. But the seder, seder meal it, it contained unleavened bread. That's that's all they had. Unleavened bread. They would also have the bitter herbs and and all that, and they would go through all that, uh, and they would start it by. Uh, a woman would start it by lighting two candles. And of course the Jews didn't, uh, they don't really know what any of that means, but I believe, and many Messianic Jews believe, that the two candles represents the first and the second coming of the Messiah. And also the fact that they were lit lit by the woman of the house, that means represents the, the virgin birth. Because she, uh, she uh, uh, the mother brought forth the child. Uh, of the seed, if you will, and uh, and so they would they would take this and go over it for uh, for for seven days, and then on the, on the eighth day they would have a big celebration. Well, what the eighth day would uh, I believe was a representation of first fruits, even though it wasn't that, that but it was a celebration that they had come through it. Uh, but anyhow, uh, then I got I got down. Lost my place here. Yeah, verse verse eighteen is what we about the month of Abib or Nisan, and when when they begin that, 
And uh, then on the ninth verse, no, nineteen, nine, verse nineteen says, "And all that open the matrix is mine, and every uh, firstling among the cat, thy cattle, where whether oxen or sheep, that that is male. But the first firsting firstlings of the of the ass thou shalt uh, redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck." All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. Uh, basically, what this is mean is it's basically saying that the firstborn uh, belongs to him, uh, just as a general rule. The first uh, the, uh, of all the cattle and everything else, basically, is saying it belongs to God. Of course, the the this, when he talks about the uh, the ass or the donkey. Uh, that's an unclean animal, and it has to be redeemed by a clean, clean animal, which here it says it's a lamb that redeems it. So the lamb would have to be sacrificed in order to keep the, uh, the uh, redeem the, the, uh, the donkey or the, or the ass. If, if they don't do that, then they're supposed to kill, kill that donkey by breaking its neck, uh, which I'm sure that they probably, if they f followed the law, they would redeem the donkey. Uh, for that for that reason uh, verse 21 says in six days thou shalt work thou shalt work but on the seventh day thou shalt rest and er, in early in early time and the harvest thou shalt rest <clears throat> six days thou shalt work on the seventh day you shall rest that's basically the Sabbath it's work they can work six days also on the first fruits they can still work uh, but except the, except the first, which is Passover, and the last day, which would, which would have been the, uh, also a day of celebration when they ate unleavened bread, uh, they would celebrate. There was a, uh, but they couldn't eat leavened bread, but they could, they could celebrate. And verse 22 then says, And thou shalt, uh, shalt observe the feast of weeks, for the first fruits of the wheat, wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end, all right. The first, this is mentioned. I mentioned the first first feast of weeks a while ago. It's uh, in Hebrew. It's called Shavuot, which means weeks, or or and Shavuot means seven weeks. So it basically means seven weeks in Hebrew. We we know it as Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit came, and it's it's a it's a uh, uh, it's counted from the day. Uh, it's, it's the counting of that, those 50 days uh, is uh, begins at first fruits when they have the first fruit feast. Probably I should draw this out for you. Might be a little more easy to understand. Uh, thrice, in, thrice in the year shall all your men and children appear before the Lord God, uh, the God of Israel. All right, here's the law that says that, that all the men uh, are to, to go to the uh, appear before God. Well, basically, what that ended up being is 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 going to Jerusalem at least uh, uh, those three times a year that they were to go and celebrate before the Lord. It would those times, I believe. If I'm going to tell it here now, but it, it's it's Passover or, or or Feast of Unleavened Bread. They can get there to there to go, or there to go on on the Shavuot, Feast of Pentecost, or there are there are to go on. Sukkot, which is in the fall, which is the uh, Sukkot means a covering, or a or a a tent, a cup, a kippah, and um, it says thrice, three times a year. That's when they're supposed to go to. The, remember when Jesus and uh, his family? He was twelve years old, and uh, he was he was going to. They went they went to Jerusalem. They were going to one of those feasts, and uh, remember uh, Jesus was. Uh, got lost or didn't they wondered out on their way home they got to wonder where's jesus at uh, or uh, and uh, i guess they assumed he was off with friends maybe playing or something but they they got concerned that he didn't show back up and so they went back home not went back home they went back to jerusalem and uh, they found him in the temple and found him debating with the with the uh, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, and uh, 
they ask him, well, why, why did you do this? Why did you scare us? So we thought something had happened to you, basically is what it was. And remember what he said? He said, I must, I, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And, and they wonder, wondered at, at what he said, but they, of course they went back home then. But um, that's what, that's, that's these three feasts. That's one of them that Jesus, I'm sure that they went more often than that, but this is one time it's mentioned in, in scripture. For I will cast out the nations for, before thee, and shall any man and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to the appear before the Lord thy God thrice a year. All right, this is interesting for it says, I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Uh, and he's speaking of during, during this particular period of time uh, when they would be entering into their in entering into their land and receiving it. But it says they're going to enlarge, enlarge thy borders. And I believe we're seeing some of the birth pangs of that too right now. I believe before it's all said and done, the borders of Israel are going to be bigger and wider than they are now. Uh, they were wider and, until the UN and the United States uh, after Six Days War and after the uh, Yom Kippur War uh, forced them to go back to the uh, to uh, other their old borders, uh, but they've never Israel has never went back to the way it was before 1967 <coughs> because that would make uh, that would put the 67 borders so small that uh, they could easily be attacked and destroyed. They could be cut in half in no time, and Israel refuses to go back. But I believe that this is one of the times that it's speaking of when Israel's borders will be increased. Uh, accor according to scriptures we've read elsewhere, that the borders of Israel are to be from the river Euphrates to the Great Sea. And uh, that's, a, that's a big period. That includes, that would, in, in, that would in, include Syria, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, uh, most of Iraq, uh, probably some of the and some of Egypt the, down the, uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah, Sinai. yeah. That all of that will be eventually, is, in my opinion, it will belong to Israel. Uh, there's, it's coming because uh, because the Scripture says that that will be the border from the from the River Euphrates to the Great Sea, uh, which would be the which would be the Great Sea would be uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. So uh, I think that's what this is talking about when it says, enlarge thy borders, neither shall any man desire the land. In other words, ain't nobody, ain't no man going to want to try to take it back. Uh, the thing about it is, another thing about this verse of Scripture, indirectly uh, talks about what happens to the land when, the, when Israel is not there. Because... Uh, uh, it says here, uh, shall, any, shall any man desire thy land? Well, what happens if, if Israel is out of the land, uh, nobody wants it. It was there for nearly 2,000 years. Nobody cared a thing about it. Now they're, because the Jews are there, the whole world is wanting to control it. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Uh, they, when... Uh, uh, what was his name? I can't remember that poet. Or, or. Anyhow, he, he, it was an American, and he visited the, the land of, it, of Palestine before the Jews were there. Mark Twain. Mark Twain, yeah. Mark Twain visited it and, and, and rode across the land. And he, and he said, his, his comment was that no, I, he didn't see how any man would want to have live in that swamp infested territory or land is it's good for nothing it smells <laughs> it's good for nothing and uh, uh rock huh what was that rock yeah rocks they got a good good crop of rocks there <laughs> yeah. but anyhow mark twain mark twain said that uh but and so when the jews started coming back 
at early times they would uh, the the Arabs that owned the that land would they the Jews would offer to buy it and they'd sell it to them. And uh, when they'd sell it to them, they'd, the the Arabs would go to the bank celebrate that they had snookered these Jews into buying an old swampy infested <laughs> no count land. They thought they had took them to the cleaners. But the Jews, I think I've told you before, planted eucalyptus trees and dug trenches and drained the swamps. And now it's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, place that, where they raise all kinds of fruit. In fact, they, uh, from what I understand, they provide most of the fruit for Europe uh, in, in Israel. If you go to Israel and you eat fruit in Israel, that's, that fruit is the uh, seconds. They send the good stuff off. They sell the good stuff off to uh, to the other countries. But anyhow, that's what it says here. No man would desire the land because when the Jews weren't there, it was a it's no good. Uh, but when the Jews are in the land, the, the land prospers, and uh, we see that going on today. And then what happens is the the Arabs get jealous. Uh, they they get upset at it, and then they want it back. Be honest with you, if the, if they were, were successful, I don't think they will be, but if they were successful <coughs> in removing the Jews from the land, it would turn back into a swamp infested nothing. It, it wouldn't be there. But it, but it's not God's intention for that to happen. They got a lot of banana plantations. Yeah, plant, bananas. You got rows and rows and rows of bananas. And uh, they got different bags that they put over them to, protect them or whatever from the insects and so forth. Well, you know, he said this is, you know, talk about bringing them back to the land of uh, milk and honey. Right? Yep. It was a fresh <coughs> yeah. yeah. it was going to be milk and honey. That's right. And, and it's that way, it's that way today. Yeah. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of like, you remember uh, uh, that tragic time when they threw the Jews out of, uh, out of Gaza? <coughs> Back about uh, six or eight years, a month, probably about ten or more years ago, the Jews had prospered the land. They were, they had built uh, uh, all kinds of, of uh, hot houses and so forth. They were raising flowers and roses, and and I think one of them I remember in particular uh, had raised roses, but others they would raise fruit and all that in these hot houses. And when the Jew, when the government of Israel forced them to leave that part of Gaza. The, they left those hothouses, though they didn't want to go, they left the hothouses and everything and said, now the Palestinians can have these hothouses and they can continue using, uh, making money from it. Well, what did they do? What did the Palestinians do? They didn't want nothing that belonged to Israel. So they destroyed the hothouses. And it turned back into nothing. It, it, it just a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you might say, in some respects. Uh, but uh, but anyhow, that's that's a good example of what what uh, what it's saying here. Uh, verse twenty six says, "And the first of the the first of the first fruits of the land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt seeth uh, a kid in." Uh, and thou shalt not seeth a kid in his mother's milk. <clears throat> this is a couple of different things. First of all, it says about the first fruits of the land. It, it all it's, it's all to uh, that to be brought to the Lord. Uh, later on, it become the uh, feast of first fruits. What they would do, uh, I've heard a couple of different things about why they would do it. But the one I I hear is that they would take a sheath. Uh, the early early harvest, the barley harvest, I think it was, uh, would they would gather the first of the best of it, and they would take it before the the uh, uh, the Lord and wave it as a wave offering, and then they would take it and uh, make whatever they food they had for it, and present that that they could use it in the on the uh, table of showbread or whatever like that. It was the first fruits of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the that celebration. But here later then, but later in this verse it says, uh, the house of the Lord thy God, thou shalt not seeth. And let's see, let's see it, seeth. 
basically it means boiled uh, or uh, roast, roasted or whatever, but mostly boiled because it's talking about in its mother's milk. In other words, you're not to uh, uh, cook a young uh, calf or lamb or whatever in its mother's milk. The Jews have taken that to the point that, Harry, you can't eat ice cream in where they sell hamburgers. That's how far they've taken that verse. <laughs> Harry knows that because he tried. He walked in one one time. And they got in trouble. <laughs> but that's what that's what it means. You, you, you can't. You know, if you you're not to cook the meat in its mother's milk, uh, and they took it way to the extreme. I guess you could say. Now, don't ask me why. I don't know what the, I'm, what exactly the reason for that is, but that's that's what the Lord wanted. Uh, and I'm sure that it has it may have something to do with uh, uh, the uh, the the value of the meat. You know, in other words, whether it's it's good or not. Well, I, I don't understand why they do it, but they do it. Uh, like all the other kosher laws that they have. Uh, it's better to eat kosher meat. I mean, that's just plain, especially at that time. If you, if you would eat unkosher meat, like a, like a pork, you might get those uh, uh, parasites uh, that was, would be in pork. Uh, but but uh, you weren't to eat it. It's not, it wasn't good for you, but the world would eat it. And uh, the Jews, because of it, the Jews uh, 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 prospered more because they were eating, eating right, you might say. They had cl cleansing laws that they would, uh, would have washed their hands uh, uh, before they, basically before they ate. Uh, whereas the rest of the world didn't care. They didn't think there's nothing wrong with eating with dirty hands, I guess. And by the way, they didn't use forks back in them days either. They had, you see a lot of the Middle Easterns still eat like that. But uh, but anyhow, and he was there, verse 20, 28, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tablets uh, the words of the covenant, uh, the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the covenant here, of course, the Ten Commandments, and of course, this is, is a... Uh, 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 Moses, this is Moses receiving these Ten Commandments again. And you remember Moses had broken the first two tablets and uh, the Lord wrote the same commandments on the second set of, ta of tablets. And also about, I think also about uh, uh, many of the other things that he's been telling uh, Moses by, I'm sure Moses either uh, kept a record, uh, kept, kept a mental record of it, he knew it, or he wrote it down, but but I think it's interesting. It says that he never, he didn't eat or drink for those forty days uh, while he was there. Uh, that basically you would say would be a fast. Uh, it would be a miraculous fast. Remember, this, that goes along with what Jesus did when he first started his ministry. Remember, he went into the after he was baptized by John the Baptist. He went into the wilderness for forty days, and, for, uh, and there he was tempted by Satan for three three times. And of course he didn't succumb to this temptation. Verse 29 says, and it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai uh, with the two tablets that of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain that Moses rest not that the skin of the skin of his face shone while he was he talked with them. In other words, his face glowed. glowed. They, they didn't like. They couldn't hardly look at Moses because he had been in the presence of God for those forty days and forty nights. And uh, so they put the. Uh, I thought, well, they put a covering over him. Uh, it says here that a skin, or the skin of his face, shone while he would talk with them. Uh, and when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. Uh, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. They were even scared of Moses because he was—he was his face was 
shining so. And Moses came unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them a commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So when they come together with him, he told them everything that God had told him that we've been talking about, uh, <coughs> about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, the, and uh, all that the, the Feast of First Fruits, basically, uh, and that they're, they're to start keeping that. And, uh, and it says, and until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. And when Moses went in, in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he had was commanded. So basically he kept the veil on him, except when, uh, when he went in to see, to speak with the Lord more. Uh, and again, I think it was, you remember what happened later on when, uh, when Moses did get to go to the promised land, when Jesus was at uh, what we call, or what's called in Israel, Caesarea uh, Philippi. It's, a, uh, it's the headwaters of the, of, of the uh, uh, Jordan River up in the northern part of the country, up where you hear them talk about on television and the news, Talk about the northern, northern Hezbollah and evacuating some people from the, that's the area that, that uh, we're talking about. Uh, that's where the headwaters of the Jordan comes out of the side of a mountain. And that mountain is Mount Hermon, Hermon or Mount Hermon, if you want to call it that. And it comes out of the side, side of it. And that's where Jesus uh, was with his disciples when he asked them, who do men say that I am? And you remember they, they, several of them said different things. And finally, Peter said, you're the Christ, the son, or the Messiah, was what he would have said, the son of the living God. And God, and Jesus, and Jesus said, uh, you said rightly, you know, and, and told him he would build his church upon that rock. Uh, and of course, that's, that's totally a different uh, a thing there because because a lot of the, uh, the a lot of denominations believe that it was Peter that he was talking about uh, Petrus, but uh, but but it was he was talking about I believe building his church upon the confession that Peter made. Uh, that when Peter confessed that, that's the confession that we are to make when we accept Jesus as our Savior, that we acknowledge that He's the Son of the Living God. And that's what we do. Uh, and, um, and anyhow, that's the rock that the Lord built his church upon. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, you think, well, uh, that means it's going to be strong. Well, it means a whole lot more than that. Because the gates of hell were right there when he said, when Jesus said that. The gates of hell was a, was a Roman uh, pinnacle or covering <laughs> that was built over the mouth of that river when it come out of the bottom, uh, out of the uh, tunnel or, or the, of the bottom of the uh, mountain, Mount Hermon. Uh, and, the, and the pagans would go there and worship it. And they called that pl place the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. And when, so I believe when Jesus said, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, my church, he pointed, I think he pointed to that gates of hell. And said, as an example, uh, and of course we know that the gates of hell have no power over the church. That's what that means, uh, and, and it means that the church is supposed to be offensive, not defensive. We think that the church is supposed to defend against defend against the gates of hell. That's not what it means. It means we are to swarm to uh, to uh, swarm the gates of hell and destroy it. Uh, of course, by the way, now. That those that place that the Romans built over that over that uh, water where it was coming out of the hill has been destroyed. Uh, it was destroyed by a uh, earthquake, along with a lot of other pagan uh, statues <coughs> and places of worship that were there. Uh, earthquake destroyed it all. Uh, they've got they've got a, they dug it out and put 
you know, little places, facts that you can read about what this was and so forth there. But the gates of hell have been destroyed, according to literally. But uh, we know that it means a whole lot more than that. It means everywhere uh, that where Satan is, is at, that we are to, uh, to swarm it or, or to de defeat it. Any comments so far? Verse 35, the last verse of the chapter, it says, And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. In other words, when he went in to speak with, with, uh, uh, with the Lord, he took the veil off. <clears throat> Any comments so far on this? On, of course, this is the end of this chapter. We've got a few minutes. We can start on the next chapter and see how many more chapters we got. I think we're about finished, aren't we? 35. 40. 40. we got about five more chapters. We will uh, we'll be finishing it up probably in a month or so. But uh, instead of, uh, I want to talk just a little bit before we, we might start in 35, but talk just a little bit about what's going on in Israel and what's going on. Our, our, our country is on teetering on the, on the brink of destruction. I'm just telling you the truth. It, it's teetering right on the edge. When our president, uh, supposedly president, uh, decides to withhold, turn his back on Israel, the only nation in the world that has stood with Israel over these past 40, 50, or 70, actually, years has been America. Uh, we, we're the only one the United, quote, United Nations continually issues declarations or, or edicts against Israel, uh, even though it's the Arabs are the ones that are doing it. We talked a little bit about it a while ago. The Arabs want to, uh, uh, to push them out uh, into the sea. That, that's one of the things. The charter, uh, the charter of uh, Hamas says that they, that's what they want to do that they are to destroy all of Israel and, uh, and take it back. Uh, uh, they had it for nearly 2,000 years and they didn't do nothing with it. Of course, we know, we know why. But, but uh, anyhow, so our, pra our president is, is, is and I'm, I'm not political, I'm not, I'm not saying this politically, I'm saying this biblically in my opinion, that though he who, he who, uh, uh, if you bless Moses, uh, bless the children of Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse the children of Israel, you will be cursed. That is a that is a rule from the hand of God. And if you turn your back on Israel, it's the same thing. We can expect something to happen, folks. Uh, if unless unless he changes his mind and and don't turn his back on Israel, I don't think he will, because he's doing it for a political purpose reasons I believe but uh, what's going to happen I don't know but I feel sure folks that we're on we're, we're, we're right on the very prefaces of some of, of something happening to our nation the reason I say that is because what I mentioned a while ago when we went in and uh, or when uh, the Jews went in and removed all the Jews from Pal uh, from um, Gaza that had the hot houses and so forth and it was a big, big ruckus about that. <laughs> and most of y'all know what I'm talking about. But what happened we could, a week later? One week after we forced Israel out of Gaza, we forced them. And, I, and when I say we, uh, our president at that time, I think it was Bush, put pressure on Israel to give up that land. And, and and to uh, to and, and move the settlers out of Gaza and let the Palestinians, so-called, to have that land. And uh, and uh, when we did, and it was our fault. Our, we pressured it. It wouldn't have happened if it hadn't have been for our government. What happened one week after that? Hurricane. Look at what happened this week. He 
spoke that this week. Guess what happened this week? Oh, what's that? We had a day of tornadoes never in history. Yep. But mm -hmm. one day, I forgot how many, but they was like 20 or 30. Yeah, people and got killed. Up, you know, I mean, he's trying to tell you something. Yeah. He means what he says. If you put your finger, if you, if you go against Israel, it's like poking your finger in God's eye. Yeah. That's what you're doing. Um, that's right. And But what happened after that in Gaza? One week later, you had a hurricane in New Orleans called Katrina. Yeah. And we had people forced out of their homes and had to move north. And we, I, remember, I remember they even had people living in the, uh, the, after the dome down there, wherever the, the where they have football games and so forth, uh, they were uh, uh, they were homeless, and so when we forced Jews to move, God forced us to move. It's that simple, and it was a week later, and you, you're just saying this happened this a week happened later. Week. That's right. I mean, he mentioned it, and that's. That, yeah. Went up to yeah. I forgot how many it was. It was up in the 30s. Yeah. Didn't know never any We had two here in Catawba County. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe, had, Joe had, States, had <coughs> pictures of two of them here in Catawba County. Yeah. But you're talking about homes. I know uh, when, when all that happened in New Orleans down there, they were gone. <coughs> In a football place there. Yeah. Uh, we took buses down there up and, and drove them, put them in Texas and another. Yep. So I, they was out. They was out of home. Yeah. Believe me. <coughs> yep. all, all their houses and stuff were destroyed. Destroyed. Yep. And uh, and like I said, that happened one week after we forced <coughs> the Jews out of Gaza. One week. And it'll happen again, folks. Well, Terry says it's already happened, but it's already happened. but if he's turned his if he's if he has turned his back on Israel one time, he's going to do it again. And uh, of course, I know we're coming up election. I ain't going to get political, but I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't care who's president. It's it's, it's going to happen. I don't, whether he's, I don't care whether he's a Republican or a Democrat or whatever. Uh, if we turn our back on Israel, it's gonna, we're going to suffer. But anyhow, I think that's uh, we got times about up. So let's let's all stand, and we will pick it up next week in the next chapter. Man, do you mind get, uh, dismissing with prayer? Lord, thank you for all gather here today to study your word. We ask that you help us to think on and, and study on it as we go out through our week. And we thank you all for the mothers here at the church, our mothers, and all the women here at the church. We ask that you guide and bless them. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good to have you all today.